I wanted to start by asking a question. What is it that separates us humans from other animals, that allows us to innovate, to build civilizations, and more or less rule the world? I know what you're thinking. Obviously, it's our minds. But it's not that simple. Humans don't have the biggest brains or even the most intellectual horsepower. In fact, other animals such as whales, dolphins, and elephants all have brains that are around 10 times the size of ours. So, what makes us unique? Well, some thinkers from antiquity, such as Aristotle, tried to put the difference down to the higher brain-to-body ratio of humans. But this turned out to be wrong as well. Science has proven that other animals, such as birds and whales again, all have a much higher brain-to-body ratio than humans. So, we come around to the same question. What makes us so fundamentally different? Well, the best answer we've been able to come up with after a couple of millennia is actually the way we perceive the world and take in information. Oftentimes, we take our perceptions of the world for granted, that there's nothing special about it and it's just how the world is. But that would be wrong. Every other animal, plant, and organism would view the world through a different lens. All their thoughts, desires, and actions are all oriented towards survival. Yep, even those adorable puppy eyes. They're in it for the long run. But I know what you're thinking. Aren't we selfish too? I mean, look at that one guy who cuts in line, or that other guy who takes a comically large spoon of ice cream. But did you see that? Well, you were supposed to laugh. The point is that even if we are selfish, we can take a step back and look at the world from a wider perspective. In fact, most of the people that we admire the most have this wider perspective on life. It could be a scientist, like Nikola Tesla, realizing some fundamental pattern that underlies the universe. Or maybe a musician, like Freddie Mercury, striking a universal chord within us all. Or maybe a political leader, like George Washington, realizing there's more to living than just himself. But there are a lot of things that go under this idea of a wider perspective on life. And the area I wanted to focus on today is time. Now, oftentimes we assume that time is something that exists. I mean, even with the topic of this TED talk, time, I mean, it assumes that time is something tangible and something that really does exist. But in actuality, the only thing that would exist would be the present moment. This idea of time being an illusion has been realized by many different thinkers from many different time periods, all the way from the Buddha to Ralph Waldo Emerson. But animals view time differently. They, quote unquote, live in the present moment which some people think we should do too. So today I'm going to analyze if this weird byproduct of our mind is really a curse or a blessing for humanity. I'll start chronologically with the past. Quick raise of hands. Who's ever felt sad or anxious because of something in the past after it's happened? The truth is we all have. It could be something petty, like when we remember our friend making that really annoying chewing sound. Or it could be something more serious, like rejection, or failing at something that you really put your soul into. The point is, we all have scars from the past that causes us pain to remember and that we can't forget. However, in comparison, animals, they don't really have the same emotional connection to the past. Say, for example, if a deer were to get attacked by another animal, the next day, if it's not dead, that is, it wouldn't have any emotional trauma and it would go on with its day as normal. Or say, for example, there were one of those chimp squabbles to see who'd become the leader. The inevitable loser chimp would also have no emotional trauma and would go on with their day usually. But that's only one half of the equation. We also worry about things that haven't even happened yet. Let's take the wolf as an example, or any other hunter animal for that matter. Oftentimes, these animals don't have a definitive idea of where they're going to get their food from. Nonetheless, they don't worry about if they are going to catch their prey in the next week or even the next day. They go on with the present moment with an almost stoic-like nature. But look at us. Even when we're pretty much guaranteed food for the next few months and a place to rest our heads, we still worry. And most of the time, it's about the most pointless of things, like what someone thinks of us. But the problem isn't necessarily all and choices that we make of our own free will, but a deeply ingrained tendency to look towards the future and to say, I have everything I need now, but tomorrow I want more and more and more. So 
Is that all? Is our perception of past and future really a curse? Well, I think no. Let's go back to the past and start from there. First on my example about deers. Yes, in one sense, you could say that their perception or non-perception of the past might be good for them. I mean, they wouldn't have any emotional trauma, they wouldn't recall the scenario, and they would go on with their day as normal. But that last part is the problem. They would go on with their day as normal. That means the next day, they would return to that same grazing spot where they were grazing, and they would get attacked again. And then the day after that, they would return to that same grazing spot and get attacked again. This process would repeat again and again and again until, well, inevitably, nature takes care of the rest. Even my final example about chimps isn't as cool as it once, as it seems to be. I mean, the loser chimp, in its next fight for power, will probably repeat the same mistakes it did that led to it being a loser. The point is, animals can't really consciously fix their problems. They have to rely on natural selection to do that for them. However, let's turn to us now. As I said earlier, we all have negative experiences from the past, but being able to recall them helps us to overcome them. We're able to discern where we went right and where we went wrong. We're able to see what we need to do better and what we need to fix about ourselves, so that in the present moment and in the future, we don't make those same mistakes. Now, let's move to the future. Um, first of all, I want to take the example of the wolf again. As a reminder, wolves, they don't really plan, for their plan to catch their prey because they don't have a definitive idea of where their food is going to come from. But is this really good for them? In the end, because of this, wolves often go starving for weeks and days as well. But if you were to look at us because of this, because of our perception of the future, we can plan ahead. And we exemplify this belief of planning ahead through most of, our ex most of our actions. Say, for example, if we were to go to the grocery store. What we're essentially doing here is ensuring that we're not going to starve for the next week. Or how about anxiety for a test? You might argue that this is bad in some sense, but is it really? This anxiety prompts us to study, to work hard, so that in the future, we're not in a worse situation. But despite all of that, we still have that insatiable desire to want more even when we're guaranteed to survive and have all the necessities we need to live. But the truth is, it's out of this insatiable desire to constantly want more that most of our daring accomplishments come from. I mean, take for example the camera, the phone, the microwave, more or less any invention. It wasn't because of some existential threat, but minds that said, yes, the present is good, but I can make the future even better. So in the end, what should we do? I'm sure most of you have heard the saying, live in the present moment. But is that really feasible? I mean, we wouldn't really learn from the past and we wouldn't prepare for the future. And even if we were to ignore them both, it doesn't mean that the past hasn't happened or that the future isn't coming. The only other option we have is to accept our unique position and our unique perceptions of past and future. To, not with the force that we do that a lot of us do right now with anxiety and depression, but with a different type of force. A force that prompts us to overcome, to dream, to plan, to prepare, to face our problems head on. Ultimately, we've got to realize that we're all on a journey. And as with any journey, the past and the future are an integral part of it. Thank you.